with that, can we have a round of applause for all our presidents? Next month will be 25 years ago, March 8th to March 13th, 1988. You've always heard the name of occurred in American history. Up until that point, we celebrated it. But now is the time for true reflection. and hard of hearing individuals, but also it has a, an impact on the overall disability community. The last book written on DPN was years and years ago when Dr. Sharon Barnhart, John Christensen wrote a book analyzing DPN, but it is now time to study the, this on a scholarly approach. And with that, we're gonna begin the celebration of the 25 years of DPN. We're studying uh, social movements currently that occurred during that time. DPN was a period when one very important moment in that category occurred. So it's appropriately beginning here, and it began here at Gallaudet. That scholarly discussion begins today with our presidents, where each of our presidents will share and dialogue about their experiences. I will introduce each one of the presidents in order of their tenure of service here. The eighth president from 1988 to 2006 is I. King Jordan. He's a Galilee graduate in 1970. And the University of Tennessee where he received his PhD in 1973 in psychology. He's from Pennsylvania. He became deaf from a motorcycle accident, a severe accident, um, and became profoundly deaf. He also is one of the most recognized disabled veteran of America. Welcome, Dr. Jordan. That's something to be very proud of. Thank you. He joined the faculty in 1973 here moved up the ranks as chair and then became the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences in 1983. 1988, he became president. He holds 11 honorary degrees and many awards. The President's Citizens Medal, the Washingtonian of the Year Award, and I think it's also um, very special to him, the Larry Schwartz Award by the American Psychology Association. Pre President George Bush appointed him as the Vice Chair of the President's Council on Employment of People with Disabilities. And recently, President Obama appointed Dr. Jordan to serve on the Commission for Presidential Scholars. And we're thrilled to have you here with us today. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the ninth president of Gallaudet University from 2007 to 2009, Dr. Robert R. Davila. Hello, everyone. Dr. Davila is the son of immigrants <coughs> from Mexico. He came here at the age of eight. He then attended the California School for the Deaf in Berkeley, and where he learned sign language and met um, other deaf individuals as a young child. He explained to me once that one of his um, friends taught him, O.J. Rourke um, taught you some sign language. He came to Gallaudet as a freshman and graduated with the class of 1953. He started teaching at Fanwood and then moved up the ranks as a principal and then went to Syracuse University 
Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to add that. While he was working at Fanwood, he was also worked as a printer and got his master's degree in education from Hunter College. And then went to Syracuse University to pursue his PhD in education technology. Then came here to teach at Gallaudet and went to Kendall School and became the principal and then was the vice president of the pre-college program, now known as Clare Center. He's been the president of different organizations, CAID, the Council of American Instructors for the Deaf, as well as the Conference of Educator Administrators for the Deaf. And Robert DeVillet was um, an outstanding leader in founding that organization. He was vice president here, then later became an assistant secretary of education in the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services in the U.S. Department of Education. It was the highest position that a deaf individual has ever held in the federal government. And I believe for um, any disabled individual in the federal government up until this point. We, of course, see more and more people with disabilities in those positions now. He also, I forgot to mention that King received 11 honorary degrees and Dr. Davila received four honorary degrees from four different universities. And I'm thrilled to have Dr. Davila here with us this afternoon. Thank you and hello everyone. Thank you. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce our current president, the 10th president of Gallaudet University, Dr. T. Allen Hurwitz. He's from Iowa. to Iowa School for the Deaf and then went to the Central Institute for the Deaf in <coughs> St. Louis. That's why I think he met Vicki, is that correct? <laughs> Hi, Vicki. <coughs> Dr. Hurwitz, President Hurwitz, um, received his BS degree in <coughs> engineering from Washington University in St. Louis then a master's degree in engineering from St. Louis University. And while he was getting his master's, he was working for McDonnell Airlines. I just want to make sure it's McDonnell, not McDonald's. I just want to make sure the interpreters got that straight. It's McDonnell aircraft. Then in 1970, he was beacon to um, become one of the first employees at NTID deaf employee at NTID. He started as an edu educational specialist and he worked there for 39 and a half years. And rose up through the ranks and whatever you, every different level of employment, he did it all at NTID. He was a department chair for engineering and computer science. He was director of um, support services at NTID support services, um, outreach and networking external networking affairs, project director for Northeast Technical Assistance Center with PEPNET. He's dean of NTID, vice president and then president of NTID and dean of RIT before he came here. He served on a lot of different boards. He was past president of NAD, NCI, and the World Organization of Jewish Death. And as well, he's presented and published widely as well. So let's welcome Dr. Hurwitz. Hello, thank you. Now, I'd like to introduce the most important person in the room who made this event happen and planned for this, Dr. Brian Greenwald, a professor of history. He has made things happen. He's presented uh, for the 25th anniversary widespread and we appreciate your work. Uh, he's coordinated all of these events. He's gonna be the moderator of the panel. He's a graduate of Gallaudet in 1996 with a BA degree and got his PhD in history from George Washington University. He was started here as one of the first two presidents fellow. He has co-authored two books, A Fair Chance in the Race of Life, 
Gallaudet University's role in deaf history, and another one um, that's in progress. He's frequently invited to speak on Alexander Graham Bell and his role in eugenics. And he also co-chaired a DPN 25 um, program. And the other co-chair is Fred Weiner. Is Fred here? Oh, here, there he is. Now, without further ado, the floor is yours, Brian. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Provost Weiner. You've made my job so much easier. First, I want to thank you all for being here this afternoon. It is indeed an honor to be with you today. History is very important to us. As our national identity and our community identity is dependent on that history. As deaf Americans and individuals from other countries who are deaf come together, we recognize the importance of our history. And as individuals, we remember specific episodes and events that have occurred. Those episodes lead to our building our identities, either as Americans or citizens of other countries, or as just individuals, and sometimes those two can overlap and intertwine. There can be profound landmark experiences that really shape our national psyche and come together to form a collective memory for a group of people. And just as an example, if we all think back to 9-11 and the tragic events that occurred on that morning, for many of us, we can remember exactly where we were at that moment. We may have been out walking or in our cars or perhaps at work or somewhere on travel, regardless of where we were, that significant moment caused our country to come together as a united front. And every individual remembers the events that occurred. The deaf community has its own historical event or landmark episode. That being DPN, or one example of those being DPN. Some of you probably weren't even born when DPN occurred 25 years ago. But nonetheless, others who are here today, perhaps former students, staff, faculty, or alumni, all of us recognize the role that DPN played within our community. Even if you were not here as a deaf person and Gallaudet during these events, there was always a tie and a connection to that moment and that time, and it remains fresh in our memory. There are so many stories that have been shared regarding that week. And just to share with you my personal story, I was at the Clark School for the Deaf in Massachusetts, an oral school that did not allow sign language. I remember being in my room that morning, cleaning up a bit before classes began. And I lived on the third floor of the dormitory there. All of a sudden, one of the young students came in and was waving wildly to get my attention, and he motioned for me to follow him. And I did. I ran out into the hall. And there was a lounge in that area, sort of a TV room, a rec room, where a number of people had been gathered. There was a group of students who were huddled together watching the television set. And I was motioned to come over to see what was going on. And I saw there, I don't know how many, up to a thousand deaf people being shown on national television, all using sign language. I was absolutely stunned. I had never seen deaf people using sign language ever before. And now here I was, for the first time ever exposed to it, through its usage amongst these thousand people being shown on te national television. The event transpired over the course of an entire week, and I watched very closely to see what would happen. And I understood the significance of the selection of a deaf president. By the third or fourth day of that week, 
This was a time when we would all come together and we at the Clark School for the Deaf developed a common shared understanding with what was happening here. We had dorm supervisors who were hearing, who were overseeing us in the dormitories to make sure we were all behaving. And typically what would happen would be we would be encouraged to use our spoken languages, our voice. But when we came together, being exposed to sign language, signing ourselves amongst one another, it was a significant shift in the way we experienced life. And that's when we decided to begin using sign language. We had no deaf adult role models who could share with us and discuss with us the significance of Deaf President Now and to help us interpret its meaning to us in our lives. We read the events what was, to what was happening through the newspaper and the media. Certainly now I understand it wasn't just about the selection of a deaf president, but it was about us coming together and gaining control of what's important to deaf people and how very significantly this has tied into our community. And now 25 years later, We have with us today three deaf presidents, three deaf presidents in the course of 25 years. In the history of Gallaudet, prior to DPN, there had never been a deaf president. And now here we have three of them this afternoon. <laughs> we'll be hearing from the presidential panel. We'll be talking about the impact of DPN, the legacy of that movement, the transformational changes that have happened as a result of the uh, presidents being deaf here at the university and how this has impacted the community and the university. So with that, let's begin. God. God. If you're ready. First, I'd like to begin with Dr. Davila and Dr. Jordan. And we'll get back to you, President Hurwitz, in just a moment. Perhaps you could explain what you've been doing since you've left the university and uh, basically have gone into retirement, if you will. Dr. Davila? Well, first, it required two years, actually, to finally accept the fact that I was not going to any office in the morning. I worked for 57 years, and the adjustment did absolutely take some time. It required time, but I, I did change. And I, I really am enjoying my retirement now. I have time for my family, which in the past I didn't have. I talk to friends more now. Um, they've called in the past, but I've always just had uh, short business relationships and talked with them quickly, but now I spend time speaking to them. I'm working on a book, a multicultural, a multicultural um, issues related to Spanish children. I'm working um, with three or four other individuals on this book, so that's taking up some of my time, and a number of things, other things. I'm writing a lot of letters, recommendations that for individuals looking for employment, so I am still busy, but I'm enjoying my retirement very much. Thank you, and Dr. George. Thank you. Uh, interestingly, I still have an office. <laughs> I still go to my office every day. I became something of a spokesperson for the rights and abilities of people who are deaf and people who are disabled when I was appointed president. It was very interesting. The way I became president was so public and so much attention was given to that that I was thrust into speaking for the rights of people who are deaf and disabled. It was like I had two jobs. I was CEO of Gaudet, university president, but I was also a uh, advocate. When I stepped down as president, I became a full-time advocate. So that's what I do. I go to my office, I speak, I serve on boards. I'm on six boards, including one corporate board. And I think I'm still the only deaf corporate director in the United States, really an honor. I, uh, I spent 
a lot of time still studying and researching about deaf issues. I published a very interesting and well-received paper with Janet Pry, a woman who was in the social work department for many years and recently retired. So I don't think my wife would let me stay home. She insists that I go to my office and I, I really enjoy what I'm doing. President Hurwitz, can you explain your plans for the next few years? What I have planned for the next few years? Well, I think I plan to be here for a while. I'm now in my fourth year, and I have to wonder where time has gone. Everything has happened so quickly, and it's been just an amazing experience. Over the next few years, I plan to continue to be here in this capacity. And I guess that pretty much sums it up. What are your plans in terms of Gallaudet University? Well, we have a strategic plan here at the university that was approved by the Board of Trustees. And now we are currently dead center of that five-year strategic plan. We are now going through an evaluation phase to determine how well we have done over the last couple of years. And we also have a number of activities that require a continuous attention. One exciting thing I wanted to mention is that we have just established a 10-year campus improvement plan that was just recently approved by the DC Zoning Board, and that was just last week we received this approval. So certainly that will be keeping us busy. And I plan to be involved with fundraising efforts to meet with folks on the Hill and to continue to get the support that we need so that we can provide the support necessary to our students. So those are my plans over the next couple of years. Great, okay. When DPN happened in 1988, I think uh, most obviously for you, for Dr. Jordan, I would like to know where the two of you were while DPN occurred. <coughs> Dr. Davila? I was living on campus. I was here. I was living behind MSSD at the time. And when DPN started, the board established uh, a management committee made up of the provost, the vice president of the business, myself, and Merv Gerritsen. That was a special assistant to the president. So the four of us were managed as a committee, but I was the only one on campus. Merv Gerritsen was on vacation during DPN week. He wasn't here. And the two other individuals were with the board in an office on K Street. So we, didn't, we weren't able to communicate. So I was here. I had free run of the place. And the protesters left me alone. They were cooperative. My wife had to actually go to a doctor appointment. And they opened all the gates. And we drove right out of campus. And were able to come back on campus without any problem. It was, I, it was very visible. I saw all the, uh, the action firsthand. So you were on campus during that time. What was your role on campus? I was vice president for the pre-college program and responsible for the education technology for the university as well. And President Hurwitz, can you share with us where you were during DPN? Well, I was actually in Rochester, New York so when everything first began, there were a number of people in w Rochester that were watching very closely. I'm sure, as you just mentioned, Brian, being a young boy at Clark School, we as well were watching the news very closely. But as the week progressed, we ended up sending two busloads full of NTID students, faculty and staff, all of them who came here to Gallaudet to really provide our support to the efforts that were happening here. 
I mean, I had an appointment meeting, so I couldn't come on the bus, but I ended up flying here a little bit later, and my wife as well was able to join in on the activities that were happening all over campus. I was able to meet with a number of different people and talk with others about what was happening on the event. Now, that was on Friday. So the following day on Saturday, we had to fly back to Rochester, but nonetheless, I kept a close eye on the media, making sure I knew what was going on. And then sure enough, on Sunday, I got a TTY notice saying that, in fact, the protest was over, that I, King Jordan, had been selected as the new president of Gallaudet University. And I can remember that moment very well. Everyone in Rochester was just beyond excited, absolutely just so thrilled with what was going on here in D.C. It was a wonderful experience. In Rochester, New York, um, did you have a lot of meetings or discussions during the protest at the time? I would guess that you know you depended on the newspapers or TV to get the information because at that time there was, of course, no internet um, available. So right. did, you, did you depend on a different form of media at the time? Well, actually, we kept in touch mostly through TTY communications. You know, TTYs in the deaf community were just fabulous back then. It was a wonderful way for us to keep in touch with one another and keep informed about what was happening. You know, you asked about what was happening in Rochester during the events here at Gallaudet's campus. As we know, the students here had four demands that they were asking to be met. So up in Rochester, up at NTID, our students came together and developed the exact same kind of demands. Four very similar demands that they brought forth to the Rochester Inst of Institute of Technology that our students who were deaf would have full access to all the services provided there. That sign language classes be provided, that we also established TTY, uh, public TTY centers all over campus. So uh, again, very similar to having the demands here. We likewise had four demands at uh, Rochester. Always, of course, chiming in on the spirit of that protest. Okay, Dr. Jordan. Um, obviously, you were here at the time. Perhaps you could explain a little bit about your role at, at the time as an administrator here and what you were doing, and briefly, what um, led you to become involved and, and support the Ooh. efforts of DPN? How much time we have? <laughs> that's, uh, that's interesting. Uh, it was an interesting week. Ooh, it was an overwhelming week. Bob talked about management by committee. One of the people on that committee managing from afar was the provost. And she was my boss, Ingold, Catherine, Catherine Ingold. She was my immediate boss. And interesting thing, communication was really different back then. Now uh, text messages and pagers and fast communication. Didn't have that same kind of communication back then. But several really strong memories from that week. One was when Dr. Ingold contacted me at home and asked me to meet the vice president for business in a restaurant on Capitol Hill. So I met the vice president for business there, and he told me that Dr. Zinser was coming. And Dr. Zinsser wanted to meet the four student leaders. And they wanted me to take her to meet with the four student leaders. So I did. And to the credit of the DPN council, the, uh, they wouldn't let Dr. Zinsser come here and meet. They insisted if she wanted to meet with the students, they would find a hotel room. So they did. They, uh, they rented a room. I still had the key to that room. I still, I still I no, really? the key to the room. And uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, six of us and an interpreter met in a regular motel room, small room, one chair, one bed, crowded in there, and really wonderful meeting because the students were very polite. They were very respectful. They were very uh, frank. 
And they told her that it was not about her. It's not you. We have nothing against you. We think you're a fine woman. But the next president of Gaudet will be deaf. And one of those students, Sherry Covell, when he was leaving, stood up and said to her, you will never be Gaudet's president. Never. So I think that was the start of the end. Then she and I, I was take her back to meet with the board. And instead, we went to a press conference at the uh, National Press Club. I didn't know we were going there. And you maybe saw on Def Mosaic or something. I stood up and supported the decision of the board. I, I was surprised to be put in front of a microphone. So I supported the decision of the board. Then I came here to go that to this room because the faculty was meeting. And some of the faculty, strong supporters of the protest, some of the faculty not supporters of the protest. So they were meeting to talk about it. And when I came in, some people were really mad at me. Ooh, mad, because I'd just been on TV. But one good deaf friend came up, hugged me, and said, I know you were forced to do that, but you should stop and think. So I went home. At home, when I got there, Dr. Pete Merle called me. Dr. Merle, fourth president of Gather, he called and said, stop listening to your brain and listen to your heart. Do what your heart tells you to do. So I thought, well, I'm being, but I'm deaf and I better start behaving like a deaf person. So the next day I stood and made a statement supporting the students. And I'm sorry that was a long answer, but that week, ooh, I knew when I made that statement supporting the students, I knew that I was shooting myself in the foot, that the board would never appoint me. I knew that, uh, but I knew it was the right thing to do. Thank you. <clears throat> Now I'd like to delve into the role of the presidents. What were some of the greatest challenges your offices have faced while you were president at Gallaudet? I could go first. Well, it was a very difficult time. First, because the public and our relationship with the government agencies didn't really understand the protests of 2006, that is. And when I arrived here, there was three major problems that needed to be addressed. First of all was the accreditation. We got some strong, strongly worded messages and letters from MSCHE that said that they wanted to come and talk with me, particularly to see what the plans were to meet some of the deficits and deficiencies that were noted. The second issue is we got some very, very bad press. Just a few days after I arrived, I went to sit down and talk with the Washington Post, and the editorial board of the Washington Post. I, I couldn't even put in a word edgewise. They were very angry and very, very critical. And I, I saw that as a being an issue. And then the campus was divided, that being the third issue. There was a lot of individuals that were hurt. And the campus needed healing, and even some members of the board needed time to heal. So it was a very sticky situation and very sensitive situation. There was obviously a lack of trust, and that's why the campus was still divided. Those issues were reasonable issues, and they were very, very serious issues that needed to be addressed. Would you like to comment? I, I, I would love to comment. That's really, that's really interesting, because 
it's almost exactly the opposite of what happened with me. When DPN happened, it was all positive. It was very, very positive. And instead of dividing, it put people together. And people inside Gaudet, outside Gaudet, people all over the world were excited and supportive and really thrilled that DPN succeeded. So my biggest challenge was that expectations were very high, very, very high. But there were also expectations that I couldn't succeed. People told me to my face that uh, we doubt you can succeed as president. I was 44 years old. I didn't have that much administrative experience. And there was a lot of skepticism that I could succeed. So my biggest challenge was to succeed. Because if the first deaf president failed, then that would set back all of what we achieved during that week, DPN. People would look and say, see, uh, deaf people are not really ready. So fortunately, I had very, very strong support here at Gallaudet. Strong support outside Gallaudet. But every day, I had to prove myself. Every day I had to be successful. Every day when I didn't want to smile, I had to smile anyway. I had to be nice to people. And so I think the biggest challenge is just succeeding. I'm sure there was a lot of pressure in that uh, position. Well, for me, the first day when Vicki and I arrived here to campus, we received a very warm welcome by the community. So it wasn't necessarily a challenge that I experienced, but there were challenges that we have played, faced over the last three years. The first one being related to the issue of enrollment. As you know, there's a proliferation of college programs throughout the United States, and so enrollment continues to be a huge challenge for us. I mean, even true to this day. The second challenge is the fiscal challenge that we're facing. Again, very different from your time, Dr. Jordan, when uh, we were able to get a lot of support from Congress and we received adequate appropriations. We continue to have very positive relationships with Capitol Hill. We have many friends who are both Republicans and Democrats. But as you all know very well, we are facing right now in our country a very significant fiscal challenge with the fiscal cliff before us, continuing resolution that we're under. All of these present the challenge that we have to confront and work with over the next couple of months and into the next couple of years. So those are the two big challenges that we have here at Gallaudet. Can I add something? You said you wanted a conversation, right? So a conversation, because this it reminds me, it's really important that the challenge of congressional relations, that's right at the top of the list of the three of us. I'm sure of that. And the people who, in 1988, doubted that a deaf person could become president, there are two primary reasons. One, congressional relations. How would a deaf person really communicate with a congressman? Or how would a deaf person really communicate with a senator? And the second was fundraising. So I had no record of fundraising. I had no record of congressional relations. But looking back, I think that two of my best successes were with Congress and with fundraising. And it was big part because of the positive nature of DPN. People loved the DPN story. People wanted to invest in deaf people. So that includes senators, congressmen, and foundations, corporations, individuals. When you went to these various uh, places to do fundraising, did you often use the story of DPN to recruit support? Almost always at the beginning. I almost always used the story of DPN. 
didn't have to start it. They knew. They know. Uh, it's funny. I, I talk about, I lived here in Washington, D.C. for 40 years. I was, I got up for 35 years. When I was faculty person, started as faculty person, I would go to parties or events, and people would ask me, where do you work? And I would say, Gala Dad. And they would say, Gala what? They had no idea what Gala that was, right here in D.C. They really didn't know. After DPN, it didn't matter where I was. Italy, Japan, <laughs> San Francisco, California. I said, Gallaudet. People knew Gallaudet. So that, I didn't have to bring up that story. They brought up that story. That's very true. I think that the public was very positive around DPN and because of the outcome, as he just explained recently was very positive and we were in a surge all over the country the civil rights surge and that was moving left and right and it was changing the whole country in ways that people thought were uh, impossible and you know reducing discrimination and that occurred at the almost at the same time and it rode along with that movement, and it was very positive. It was a very positive outlook. So earlier you mentioned a bit about the media and your experiences in terms of the struggles you faced when you got here to campus, dealing with media issues. I wonder if we could take a moment here and talk about a bigger question, and that is, what was your role with the media? If each of you could share a little bit about what you faced in terms of your role in the media, whether it be attention that you received from the media or a variety of different issues related to that. And how did the media impact your role as president as you managed relations uh, with media? And we're speaking, obviously, from 1988 to today. Media over that time has changed significantly. So, Dr. Jordan, when you became president back in 1988, there was a lot of print media, newspapers and magazines, uh, you know, conversations that happened in that context, and some video. But if we look to today's era, there's a significant change in how we receive me media. A lot of it's done through television, through uh, video blogs, through Facebook, through Twitter, through the internet. So social media is much more common these days. And I'd like to hear from each of you your view of the role of media and how it plays into the position of president. Well, we had very good support from our own media department on campus. But um, we, are dead, we weren't where we were you know, 25 years ago now, we've made significant changes. And even during my time here, what, six years ago now, we didn't have then what we have now. So it is it's for a lot of people to be involved in what was um, available, if we were going to be interviewed. We were interviewed by uh, different public media outlets, like Howard University, we, we had to visit with uh, the Secretary of Education at times. We would go and up to the Hill. We would talk to the staffers and talk to individuals and make decisions you know, about our funding face-to-face. -face. We had to contact individuals and we had to look for ways and create more broad understanding among us, uh, among as many people as possible. It was, it's not possible to meet with every individual one-on-one, -on -one, so we had to broaden our uh, media sources and how we contacted these individuals. DPN was on the front page of the Washington Post seven straight days. I'm not sure mm -hmm. many things appear on the front page seven straight days. DPN was on the front page of the New York Times five out of seven days. DPN was the lead story on local TV every night and national TV often. The media, the press is 
neutral. Wink. <laughs> Wink. The media was not neutral. The media really supported DPN. When I was named president on Sunday, March 13th, that happened across town. Then I drove here to campus with my two children and my wife, four of us, drove here. By the time I got here, it was already a big party happening in Ely Center. And I walked into that party, half the people there were media celebrating with the uh, students. So, so that really kickstart my relationship with media. It was very positive. And during my presidency, I worked really hard to keep it positive. Always keep them informed of what was happening. Met with the editorial board of the Washington Post, like you mentioned. Tried to be on radio, TV as frequently as possible because DPN was huge and we didn't want people to forget. We wanted to keep in their minds what DPN was about. President Hurwitz? <clears throat> well, you know, the, the function of media is very important here at Gallaudet. And we are very fortunate that we have a very strong communication department here that's been built over the last three years to you know, respond to the number of issues that we face. We've also received some training on how we could communicate better with people who are part of the media. And we've provided training to faculty and staff and students. So should they be approached by the media, they have that training. And so we're very fortunate to have this, the support of our media department here on campus as it is. Of course, we will continue to build on those efforts into the future. You know, also it's a very important part of our work in terms of how we can get our story out and to market ourselves. As I was talking earlier about the challenge we face with uh, the enrollment numbers, with the proliferation of colleges and universities that are nowadays available to deaf and hard of hearing students, many of those students are asking themselves, why should they come to Gallaudet University? So the communications and marketing efforts play a significant role in assisting us in reaching out to those individuals to help them understand that Gallaudet University is the university of choice, first choice that is, for many young deaf and hard of hearing people. So it's a very important function that the media plays here. Okay. I would like to shift topic for a moment. I would like to ask you about the role of the president in terms of being the president of Gallaudet University, which is um, a unique role, as we know. You have to lead the university you're the chief officer of Gallaudet University. At the same time, Gallaudet University is for deaf and hard of hearing students. We are the, the business of training and educating students to become effective leaders in the 21st century. So, and many people also view Gallaudet's president as an unofficial representative for the deaf world and the deaf community. So I'm just wondering how you use your role as president in balancing your support and efforts between being the chief officer of the university and as a representative of the deaf community. Maybe I'll go ahead and start again. You know that's a very good question. Traditionally, because education of the deaf is the oldest special education system in the country, Gallaudet has always been a leader. A leader such as Harvard, you might say. Harvard doesn't have to go and look for students. Every student knows where Harvard is. And 90% of the deaf children who would go to these special schools for the deaf, you know, 
If 75 came, then obviously their world would change. So now we are among 16,000 school districts in the country. And we could count hundreds of thousands of individual schools in each of those districts. Schools are all over the place, as are deaf students, and it's very difficult for us to find them. So it's important to develop strategies to find them and introduce them to this concept that Gallaudet University offers, that what we can do for them and that it is available for these students. So we had to focus more closely on how we would go about reaching out to these isolated students. Well, at the same time, we cannot get caught just looking past our students. Our first responsibility is always to our students. As they come here, we have to have a program to serve those unique individual interests. Should students have problems or deficiencies, if they need to be corrected in some way, we have the responsibility to develop programs to respond to those needs accordingly, which, as you can understand, is just an overwhelming task. There's not enough money in the world to do everything. We can't change the world. We can make Gallaudet better. So it is an enormous responsibility that the board and the community here has to decide what our priorities should be at this university. We want to focus on making Gallaudet fantastic with all its programs so that we can respond to any problem and plan very carefully to do so, or do we want to go about you know, changing and fixing problems that are beyond our abilities. So I think that's something that needs to be thought through and discussed very carefully. You know, when you talk about education and advocacy, sometimes that uh, they're interconnected. So sometimes we don't know if we're in the role of advocacy or educating the, the public. So it's important for us to understand in our role and to give you an example, I meet with Congress frequently. I don't go about doing advocacy work for Gallaudet. However, I give them um, information, sufficient of information, and the right kind of information that will help them make the correct decisions. And in terms of advocacy, it's important that we set up a strong partnership with consumer adv advocacy organizations, such as the National Association of the Deaf, and the Hearing Loss Association of America and the various advocacy groups that are in existence that we need to work closely with. And it also is our responsibility to educate our students so they become future leaders and then they learn how to lead organizations and they learn how to become self-advocates on various topics. And we can encourage them to participate at a national convention of the National Association for the Deaf where various organizations, the Black Deaf Advocacy, for example, the Hispanic organizations, their Deaf Women United. So there are various organizations that they can participate in, and so it's our responsibility to provide them an opportunity in becoming future leaders. I'm not the only person who can answer all of the various questions, so what we want to do is promote our students and faculty and staff in becoming leaders in their own various ways. And that is my philosophy, is, is providing these opportunities for students to become leaders of their own. I'd like to follow up uh, with the comment that you just made there. You know, some people strongly believe that the president of Gallaudet University plays a very significant role in just the field of deafness and deaf people. As you know, there are many schools for the deaf throughout the country. And generally speaking, the number of deaf schools is rapidly declining. And some people believe that Gallaudet's president should be the one who's being very proactively involved in fighting for the rights and the existence of these schools for the deaf and saving the schools and getting involved in ad advocacy in that manner. So could you share with me your thoughts about that particular question? So I can uh, expand a little bit more on that. If you would. And then I'll turn over to Dr. Davila. I understand uh, your question. Oftentimes I find myself in a position where I should become um, an educator or I should be advocating. So 
I work closely with organizations, and there are a lot of different organizations that have a vested interest in that particular topic. So it's important for us to work closely with the organization. But for me, as the president of the university, I'm the only one, not necessarily the only one doing it. That's not necessarily what I believe I should be doing. I uh, do believe that we have K through 12 programs that have wonderful um, vice presidents and presidents across the United States that are leading these schools. We, uh, we also have a national mission here at the Clare Center um, to provide resources uh, for schools for the deaf as well as public schools and providing an opportunity for exchanging information and sharing some ideas for best practices amongst these schools. So that's where I see an opportunity for the Clare Center to become the leader in deaf education across the United States. And I'm there to provide them support. And sometimes I am invited to present that I will then rely on the Clare Center to provide me with all of the data and information necessary to present so I can share this information with the public. Thank I you. want to echo what they both said about the first priority has to be the students who are here. You really, God, that university, God, that university, that's the most important thing, providing a good education to the students who are here, allowing them to become leaders here and become future leaders. And I really like the idea and the knowledge that the Clare Center is the expert at Gallaudet on education of the deaf more generally. I think your first question, very hard question, because how did we spend our time? And really, you could spend all your time focusing just on Gallaudet and the education of the students here, or you could spend all of your time on outside issues Steve Weiner said social moment and social movement. And really, the deaf community looks up to Gallaudet as a leader and looks up to the president of Gallaudet as a role model for a successful deaf individual. And all those things are good, but you can't spend all your time on them. You have to, you really walk a thin line between doing one or doing the other, and the top priority has to be the academic programs here at Caldet. Well, you know, parents no longer have the final authority. I mean, they're supposed to, but they really don't have the final authority when it comes to determine a program placement for their children. And the public schools are basically screening students. The academically strong students are not recommended or allowed to go to schools for the deaf. They'll keep them locally instead. If there are weaker students that require you know, certain skills and experiences that require too much, then they'll send those students to the schools for the deaf. So if we still depend heavily on those traditional schools to be our pipeline for our students here, then we need to shift our focus to see how we can get those other students here to make sure that they're successful and they end up graduating. We need to know what are the redeeming values a student would have by spending their three or four years here on campus but leaving without a degree, but nonetheless having successful skills that they've gained during that time. So those are the kinds of things we need to do. Gallaudet and its president are symbolic leaders. That has always been the case. There's a position of very high regard from the community with enormous expectations that are placed to Gallaudet. You know, we no longer are thinking we're in a position where we can meet every request that's made of us, but rather we have to be much more selective and do the best that we can with those issues that we select to take on. I think that goes back to the impact of DPN in terms of the president's office. Now, how did DPN uh, occur? And the result of that has made your work easier or more challenging or more difficult? 
do people hold you more accountable at this point? And what are your views on how DPNs impacted your work as president? Answer, you ask, DPN make your job harder, easier, hold you more accountable? I was sitting listening to you tick them off. The answer is yes <laughs> to all of them. <laughs> sometimes it's harder, sometimes it's easier. The, uh, the challenge is what Dr. DeVilla recently said about symbol. A movement needs a symbol. And the DPN movement needed a symbol. When it succeeded and the deaf person was appointed president, that person became a symbol of success. And that's big responsibility. Bigger responsibility than the presidents before had. The presidents before, highly respected, but they never had to be spokesperson for the rights of deaf people. They never True. had that responsibility. They, you know, half of my invitations to speak have nothing to do with deafness. The disability community at large know the ADA passed in 1990. The two sponsors of the ADA, the House sponsor, Congressman Hoyer, and the Senate sponsor, Senator Harkin, both said that ADA would not have passed without DPN. DPN kick-started ADA, and the nation paid attention, Congress paid attention. They saw, hey, people with disabilities can. And that's, that's really how ADA passed. So there are people all over the country whose lives are different now than they would have been without ADA. And ADA passed because DPN helped start it. You know, I was president for, uh, I was president 20 years after DPN. And during that time, there were a number of changes that have happened in the lives of deaf people. You know, it, and they've been internalized even here at Gallaudet. People may not know where they started or where they came from, but for me, there are two significant things that continue to influence change. DPN, of course, was very positive, but the first thing is really the breaking of the glass ceiling. I think that was the whole purpose of DPN that a deaf person now has the ability to serve in that capacity. And everyone in the deaf community knows that if they had to pick, they should pick a deaf person or seriously consider a deaf person. And of course, that would be required of the board. And unfortunately, back at the time, 20 years ago, that wasn't a consideration, although it is now. Secondly, it's opened the door to full acceptability of American Sign Language here in our country. It also has set required standards for performance here on this cam campus. So those are two huge issues that have been driven as a result of DPN. And I believe Gallaudet will always be here because of DPN. Right, before DPN uh, occurred, and I was at the Rochester Institute of Technology, Technology I had never thought that I'd ever become a dean or even president. I never even considered it. I thought it would be impossible as a deaf person to become the dean at a hearing university. I just never even thought about it. After DPN and how that raised that knowledge and consciousness of, of the public that deaf people can do anything that they want to become. And Dr. Jordan, you use that uh, phrase often, deaf people can do anything but hear. So when uh, Dr. Davila became vice president at RIT, I think that was uh, in 1996, mm -hmm. right, in 1996, I never thought about becoming a dean, but two years later, he appointed me as dean. So that was a significant breakthrough for um, a regular university like RIT. They would never thought uh, even a deaf person could do it. 
but I think that DPN created that possibility. So after Dr. Davila retired and I became the next vice president and then over time became president and then when I moved here, a deaf person has taken that position and followed me. So DPN has opened all sorts of doors that, and it was certainly a breakthrough for the deaf community. DPN and ADA, both the follow up on your comment, people now, many people here probably weren't born when DPN happened. Many people who are disabled weren't born when ADA was passed. And so many wonderful things we do every day, we take for granted. VP calls, VRS calls, captions on TV, go to the movies and see captions. Interpreters, when you go to see your doctor, always provided, all you have to do is ask. All these things, people now just take them for granted. So the point I want to make is don't do that. Don't take them for granted because young people have to continue to advocate, have to continue to work. No, there was a lot of talk about changing ADA and weakening ADA. There could be a lot of talk about weakening some of the rights that deaf people have achieved. Captioning, captioning is there, but the quality of captioning, sometimes really awful. There's no regulation about quality of captioning. The TV programs have to provide captioning, but watch MSNBC tonight. Watch a program called Hardball and see if you can follow Chris Matthews. You can't. The captions, the captions can't keep up. MSNBC does care. I've written letters to MSNBC. They do their caption on the cheap. So I need people in this audience and young people, people to advocate to keep on pushing, pushing, pushing for better access, better quality of life. That's what the leaders of DPN did 25 years ago. Do it now. Do the three of you feel that being deaf is a definite criteria for the next president? Everyone expects that the president of Gallaudet will be a very capable and qualified person. That's first and foremost. There's no debatable bit debating that issue. Before, there was a question as to whether or not there would any deaf person would be able to meet that criteria, and that's no longer a question because we know there are deaf people who meet that criteria now. So all things being equal, if you pick a deaf person for this position, you're sending a very powerful message. But does that mean the person has to be deaf? But no, I mean, as long as we have a highly qualified person and we have deaf people who are highly qualified and capable of administering as they are, then I think a deaf person would very really be appropriately selected. 15 years from now, when he's ready to retire and the board makes an advertisement for the next president, if they put down must be deaf, I think they'd be in trouble. I don't think you can put down, you must be deaf. But honestly, I can't imagine any time in the near future a board at Caldet appointing someone who is not deaf. Because like Dr. DeVita said, there are many, many deaf people out there who have the necessary qualifications and characteristics and skills to become president. I support uh, both of their comments. I think it's our responsibility to be sure that young deaf individuals have an opportunity uh, for leadership development. That's the best way, uh, through getting experience, to becoming committee chairs, and then moving up the ranks to become department chair, and then assuming responsibility as associate dean or associate 
vice presidents and so forth and just moving up the ranks and have a solid foundation. That's where an opportunity is to learn, to learn the ropes that's required to manage a university and run a university. You, you don't have to come from one level jumping up to another level, but you have some fundamental skills in place. I see now more and more deaf individuals that are moving up the ranks in various positions and places. And that is our future, and it is our responsibility to make sure that happens. So we're now approaching the end of our time here, and I did want to ask one final question of each of you. And this question is specifically about the impact that DPN has had. What do you think is the legacy of DPN? What are the lessons learned from DPN? I think I had to focus on that. And my answer is that you have to have a transparent working relationship with everyone here. This campus, more than any other campus that I've worked at, I've worked at other universities, and it's different here. Deaf people are always craving information and ability to communicate and understand what's going on so that they they know and are aware and we need to be very transparent in our efforts and be open about everything and use whatever assistance that our media department could give we set up those uh, video blogs sending out memos and communicating every which way we could. We would go to meetings, we had student coffee meetings, we had faculty meetings, coffee and so forth, and a, and a lot of time was spent on communicating. It was twice as much communication than I usually did at other positions. And I think that that's part of this campus and how it's opened up. And it has to remain that way. Because all of us will be successful. And if not everyone succeeds, we will all fail. So that's something important to remember. No, you go. go. Okay. No, you, I, you go ahead. I, uh, I want, because you said this is the last question, I want to talk about uh, one thing that I haven't had the opportunity to say that I think is important because of who you are, uh, I reflected on this conversation oh, the last few days, and I thought, what am I proud of? I got that. What my present day, what things am I most proud of? And some things are really easy to see, like the Student Academic Center, the God at Kellogg uh, Conference Center, the Science and Language and Community. Communication Center, those things were built with uh, money that was raised while I was president. I'm really proud of them, but I'm a lot more proud of uh, things about people. And one of the programs that I set up that I'm most proud of was called President's Fellows. And that program helped deaf people work to achieve their terminal degrees, earn PhDs. The idea was to grow our own deaf faculty people. And I know you were the first deaf fellow back in 1999, 2000, maybe 2000. 2000, uh, 2000, 2000 right. And, and I remember very well that you applied to study for a PhD in history. And now I look at the Gallaudet faculty, many young deaf people who have PhDs who had helped while they were working on their PhDs, and I'm very, very proud of that. Okay, shift to thank, <laughs> thank you. you for your stuff. Shift to the legacy question. I agree with what Dr. Davila said about transparency. That's really important. I want to talk a little bit, I'll borrow your words, because I want to talk a little bit about outside Gallaudet, I think it was right here on March 14th, 1988, had a press conference 
full of uh, press people asking really easy questions. Later, I learned the expression puffball. They were throwing me puffball questions, you know, easy to answer. I was really cool. Then at the very, very end, somebody way in the back asked me, said something like, well, this is all good. You know, I'm happy for you. I'm happy for God that. But really, even with the college degree, what can a deaf person do? So I was standing there, puff ball, puff ball, <laughs> smiling, everybody was funny. And then this guy had the nerve to ask me, what can a deaf person do? So I answered him, deaf people can do anything except here. That kind of became a mantra during my presidency, and since still a mantra. And they're not just words. It's really, really important. I think DPN allowed everybody to see that deaf people really can do anything except here. Thank you. And any last comments, President Hurwitz? Well, in terms of lessons to be learned, as I was reflecting on that and considering what the current issues are now and how we can use what we learned at DPN to today's issues, to today's you know, societal concerns, we think about issues of diversity and inclusion. Obviously, these are issues that all of us struggle with. We've had a number of different kinds of dialogues. And a dialogue is not something that's just a one-shot deal, but rather it's a continuous opportunity to speak with others, to better understand one another, to better learn about each other, learning how to be civil towards others, being supportive and respectful, and understanding and sharing other perspectives. In this capacity, I think we still have a long way to go, and I believe that one of the lessons that we've learned from the legacy of DPN, while we were very successful at that time, it was because we came together in a united front. And now when we look to the enormous diversity of perspectives and opinions of different races, of people with different different educational backgrounds and individuals who have different views and technologies, the way the technologies have impacted, you know, what may happen now and into the future. With all of these different perspectives, I understand that we have a lot more work to do. And I do plan to speak more about this in my uh, State of the University address that will be happening that will be happening in February. So I'm still sort of ruminating on some of those ideas, and I'll be sharing more about that with you in the State of the University Address. Thank you so much. We have now run out of time. Um, this semester, we will have additional time to, to discuss the impact of DPN um, over the last 25 years uh, through different lecture series, uh, panel discussion, and showing of different films. So thank you so much um, for taking the time to come out this afternoon Thank you. for this presidential panel. Thanks to all of you. Thank you.